Hello, hello, good afternoon. We are here today. I'm bringing you a really great interview with Desiree Robards, who is the founder of Naked Digital Marketer, um, which is an agency that she started all about organic marketing. So marketing without doing paid ads. Um, Desiree is going to join me in a moment. She's got built such an amazing business um, because she helps so many people with their website and the website is really a key piece of your organic marketing um, just letting her in now. of your organic marketing uh, what will you call it the, um, the pieces of the puzzle of your organic marketing because in order to be found by people you need a great website um, that is search friendly and that people can find when they are looking for you um, but it's not just about them finding it it's also about them taking that next step and booking in a call with you um, and converting them through to the next stage of the customer journey so that's what we're here to talk about today really excited thanks for joining Desiree great to see you <laughs> great How to you see doing? you too thanks for having me um, you'll have to excuse me, I'm not feeling very well and I had a really bad sleep last night. So I look a bit like that, but um, <laughs> you just have to push through. Uh, so, well, we can't tell from where we're sitting. You look fine to me. Um, <laughs> so thanks for coming on today. I know that lots of people are really interested in this topic. And, you know, I think now that we are um, online more than ever, our businesses are online, everybody is looking for stuff online, especially when we're in lockdown, because that's the only place that we can be, um, you know, your website is more critical than ever. And, you know, I started working at websites back in the early 2000s, even late 90s. And I know that back then they were really an online brochure, you know, it was like, here is our company, this is who we are, and this is what it's about. There was a contact form, um, that was pretty much it. Whereas these days you look at a website and a really great functional website is, it is your first, um, it's the first contact that most people have with you. It's like they're your 24 seven salesperson because that is um, where someone might find you and decide really quickly if you're the one for them. Should they even bother reading further? Should they bother making contact with you? Um, so the website plays a pivotal role in our business um, and marketing our sales funnels. So I'm going to hand over to you and you're going to share with us your seven, the best ways, I guess, to increase conversions, because I'm sure that, you know, they're probably way more than seven, but we'll start with the seven that everybody should know about and be thinking of. Sure. And everything you've just highlighted is um, absolutely true. Um, you know, gone other days that, you know, you just have that presence Whereas now it's, you know, what can your website do for you without relying on you to be um, actually there um, so mm -hmm. that the person can take the next step and, you know, um, book a call, use your calendar to book a call with you or purchase your product or um, a service off your website without actually having to speak to you. Um, and, you yeah. know, if, if you don't have your website and it's not being found in search engines, then they're going to find the next person, your competitor, who does have all of those things and so it's an easy choice for them to make you know have someone that makes it so easy to get in touch with them um so some yes. of the things i'm going to highlight so is seven but uh, <laughs> within that seven points and um, there are lots of uh, little things as well so it's, it's even hard to just narrow down the seven because there's so many aspects to a website that you can work on and improve um and so i'll start with the first one which is the value proposition and a lot of this, um, a lot of websites I see um, miss this part, which is so essential. It's basically when someone lands on your website, you know, you have three seconds to make that impression so that mm. they understand at first glance who you are, what you're offering and whether you can help them and even a point of contact. Yeah. So um, when someone lands without even scrolling or clicking around, you know, do you have that information clearly displayed so they're not guessing and having to scroll and click around to try and find out what you're offering and why they, how they ended up there. Um, so an example would be a, a great first image, whether it's a, a product um, or it yourself. If you're a service-based business, then um, try and have your face front and center um, because you are your brand usually. If you're a one-person show running a service-based business, you are your brand. Um, and that's the first thing people connect with, a person that's behind the business. 
So have that as um, the first main image and then a tagline or a summary of um, usually one line of what you can do, what, how you can help them. Um, and uh, either a button to contact you or have, you know, some people have their social media icons or a contact us button right up the top or the email situated right at the top. Um, so without even, you know, thinking, they already know who you are, what you look like, um, and whether they actually want to engage with you much further than that. So don't miss that opportunity. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And I think the big... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think a really um, key thing is that people can, you know, straight away tell whether this is something that's relevant to them as well, because they might have clicked through from Google search or wherever they've come from and found your website, but they've still got that question mark, you know, is this relevant for me? Is this business, you know, do they work with me? So it's not even just about who you are, but it's actually more so about them. Like, is there something that's going to help them to think, yep, this is what I'm looking for. I'm ready to read more. I'm ready to spend a bit more time here. Absolutely. Um, the next point that I have is um, copywriting, which means mm -hmm. the words that go onto your website. Um, another thing that's often um, skipped by uh, people who, uh, especially those who DIY their own websites, and it's totally fine to DIY your website, but there are certain things you can do um, to really help you build a website that gets found organically. Um, so the purpose of copywriting is to, well, two main purposes. One is um, to, you know, tell your story, have your brand personality. So someone who's reading it can understand easily what you're offering, how you can help them, um, you know, you get yeah, the tone of voice um, and go, yep, that's exactly why I clicked through to the website and this is why I'm here, this is why I need you. Um, but the other big purpose of it is to actually have the keywords that Google can then um, match it up to someone who's searching for that service or product that you're offering um, or the problem that you're solving. So if you have blogs as well, then that's where copywriting kicks in with the SEO keywords that um, and phrases as well that people are literally typing into Google to bring up your website. Of course, you can mm. pay for ads to drive that traffic there, but you want to build your website so it's working actually harder organically. Um, and the way to do that is to have enough word content on each page. And then there's also, you know, Google's checklist of what they actually require from you. So um, things like each page should have a minimum of 300 words. And that sounds like a lot, but if you section it well and you have your proper headings and titles um, and you lay it out in different sections, it's easier for someone to digest rather than one whole paragraph or one whole block of text. Mm. So and That's one of the things I think that's changed a lot from, you know, even say 10 years ago, we used to have a lot of websites that were flash-based sites and people would say you have to have everything above the fold so that people don't have to scroll. So there was a lot more pages and the sites were a lot deeper and a lot less scrolling and therefore a lot more, less content per page. Whereas now the scroll is great because people are on mobile and on mobile they are scrolling. Um, they prefer to scroll than to be clicking through pages because it's not as easy to navigate through a site on mobile as it is. Um, on your desktop so you know I think that that is a real shift and I've you know still see some people who have that mentality of you know I've got to have everything above the fold and that people won't scroll it's like no guys everybody scrolls you know put the content in the page you know don't be afraid there really isn't too much content in the page as long as it's relevant and it's making sense and it's flowing through you know keep adding that content in because Google loves a really content rich website and and those pages that have you know, upwards of one to 2,000 words on them, much better than having a page with even just 300. Hmm. And, and a simple exercise that I ask people to do is um, think about 10 to 15 keywords that someone might be typing into Google to find a website like theirs or find a service that they're providing. And out of those um, words, how many of them are actually present in the website? So if they're not actually present on the website, then it's time to rethink how you can sort of rejig your content so that you can fit in these keywords. But then there comes the skill that, you know, so that it doesn't look like an Alibaba or eBay ad that you're just putting keywords <laughs> in there and that you're actually telling, yeah. you know, it makes sense to a normal person reading it um, that you're trying to attract. So that's where the brand personality and actually conveying your information in, in an easily digestible way. So if you if you don't have that skill, it's totally fine. I 
I can't think of anything worse than sitting there and trying to write copy. So I have my copywriters do my website and blogs as well. So it's something you can easily outsource, um, but definitely worth investing because you can also use that content across lots of different platforms like your emails, um, your social media bios and things like that. So that's copywriting. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, the next one I wanted to mention is the user experience. Um, yeah. The number of websites I've come across where someone has designed it or the business owner has designed it because that's how they like um, the, the look of it and how they would use it. Um, they, they brain dump, they dump all the information out of their head and onto their website. And they're not actually thinking about how their potential customer is actually going to digest that information or use the website or click around how can they find the information that might seem second nature to the business owner but someone who's um, you know knows they need a service but doesn't quite understand yet um, how would they use the website to get that information so yes. really thinking about how that user is going to be using the website firstly you know even just what device they're more, more likely going to be using is it a mobile is it a desktop you know is it a tablet and all of this information you can get for free if you have your google analytics connected to your website um and then thinking about how your menu is displayed you know is it um quite clear and um not not just having lots of buttons on there because for the sake of having a menu so you know having your home page your about page um your services and then do you have sub pages under your services um, keep it nice and neat and um, that it makes sense to someone who doesn't understand anything that you are offering at the moment, but they can easily click around and also between the pages to have inter, inter page links as well. Mm. So they don't always yeah. have to go back to the main menu. Yeah, this was such a big one. I remember when I used to work in corporate, um, you know, a lot of companies wanted to design their website the way that the company was structured. So they'd want to have like departments as sections of the website. And I'm like, guys, that's, that's internal knowledge. No one else is looking at your business that way. They are coming looking for what they're looking for. So we've got to order the website in the way that makes sense to the external person who's coming in, you know, thinking, well, where would I find information about this? Um, you know, and rather than how we structure it internally, which is not, nothing, it's not relevant to anybody else. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, it was so funny to try to get people to take this shift because <laughs> they just didn't understand it. But you're right, the user experience is really critical. Um, you know, if people can't find what they're looking for quickly and easily, they are just going to leave. Um, they give up. Yeah. Um, people have no patience these days. So it needs to be user friendly and being in, in that it's it's intuitive. Um, you know, some of the really basic stuff that I see a lot of people get wrong are things like um, links and buttons and call to actions being in different colors. And, um, you know, you might think it looks nice having a button in another color here, another color here, but these are key um, what do you call signposts for your user. So when you have a consistent color for all your call to actions, it's really easy for them to say, oh yeah, I need to click there or I need to click here. Um, so often there's links buried in text and maybe, you know, sometimes you get a default um, formatting setting these days without an underline on a link, but then there's not much of a color variation between the standard text and the link text. It's like, well, how is anyone expected to know that that's a link um, unless you're making it really clear? So it's that kind of stuff where you've got to think no one's sitting there reading every single word. They're not going through your site in the detail that you are. They're scanning it, trying to find what they're trying to get out of it as quickly as they possibly can. So you've got to make it easy for them and make that stuff stand out. And that is taking your usability of your website up to the level that's going to help you convert more people. Yeah. So it comes down as well to um, uh, the font that you use. Um, so this one actually affects not just, you know, it doesn't too slow, um, but also it affects your Google rankings organically. 
So the, if Google thinks that your website is too slow, then um, it's not going to prioritize your website over any other website that's there. So things like, you know, making sure that you actually mm -hmm. optimize your images before you upload them. So don't upload them and try to um, change the size while it's up on the website because it's still taking up space. Um, mm. any, any images that you replace and you're not using, delete them because they're taking up space on your website as well. Um, and just constantly testing that against different um, free testing websites like gtmetrics.com um, and Google's PageSpeed Insights. So um, doing that every now and again, just to make sure you're on top of that. And, you know, you might have up uploaded a, a, a PDF um, to download and stuff like that. And that might have been a very large file. So see how you can optimize that before you upload. Mm. Um, and then one more thing with the user experience as well is the responsiveness. So it might look good on a desktop, but it might not work very well on a mobile. So don't just check on your mobile. We use other people's mobiles. So if you have an iPhone, try and get a Samsung. Um, iPads and different types of iPads, different orientation as well, portrait and landscape. Don't just rely on the computers uh, or the program's um, mobile version because it might look different against different devices. Um, that is so important and also something that is picked up on by Google and penalized if you're not, um, if, you're, if someone's constantly pinching and zooming to read the text on your website or to look at the images, that all gets picked up by Google. I don't know how, mm. but that's just how the <laughs> algorithms and stuff work. Um, yeah. The next, um, so yeah, the, just really bearing in mind, it's not just you and your laptop and your phone. Um, there's, there are many, many other devices out there that you need to cater mm. for and make sure you build your website to be responsive that way. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, can trip up people sometimes as well is if you're uploading an image that's got text on it. Um, so, you know, that's been a really common one, probably less so now. I think people are getting used to um, having text in HTML itself. But, you know, an image with text on it, then the actual whole image is resizing for the mobile view. And so if it looks great on desktop, but you just need to check, is this image still working on a mobile? Can people even read it? Because when it's resized into the mobile screen, it may be too small for someone to read that text. And that's mm. where you can do something really simple like having um, two sections for that piece and having one that's visible on desktop and another one with a different formatted image. Um, if you have to have text on an image, but I always try to say, please put your text in the HTML. Um, you know, it, you can have one for mobile, one for desktop on the same page and just have them um, made visible for the right device um, so that you can still have a great experience there. But yeah, that's something I think a lot of people mistakenly don't realize uh, is happening when they build their site. Yes, so they, they aim for more of a pretty looking website on a desktop as opposed to how it actually functions across other devices. So yeah. the, the text the text in an image is um, not just that, whether it's being resized properly, but also if you're not using image alt text properly, then Google can't look at an image and go, oh yeah, I can read and understand that's a woman wearing a hat and that's what the words say. It can't unless you have that that text behind the image in image image alt text, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, so try and uh, not upload too many photos with images uh, with text on them because um, it's a lot mm -hmm. more work to try and get um, Google to understand and also for it to be optimized on um, different devices. Yeah. Um, my next point is going to be about the customer journey, so the user journey. Um, again, this comes down to how you're displaying your content and where you're placing them and how your menu looks. Um, basically, things like how many clicks does it take to actually find out, uh, find your contact details? How many clicks does it take to um, view that product that you, you've mentioned on your homepage? Um, you, you know, you really want to make it as um, less clicks as possible to actually have that sale or, or make that next action, which is, you know, if you wanted to book your calendar um, and things like that. So don't just bury things. Um, a lot of people do things like um, the about page is hidden in the footer somewhere, whereas, you know, a lot of us are small business owners and we can't afford to hide our about pages. People want to connect with that small business owner. So keep it up in the menu, on the top menu um, and things like that. So um, think about how many clicks it takes to make that sale or make that next step. And also, um, yeah, uh, how how buried is your content that you actually want people to find? Are mm. you making it easy for them to, to locate that information? Mm. Um, I've got so a that's question where... here. 
Somebody's asked, how often should you change the layout of a site? Hi, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're very close to launching um, Rachel's Shopify store. Um, <laughs> how often should you change the layout of a site? So this comes in, um, I guess you call it a redesign as well. So um, I would say on average is about every two to three years, sometimes two years. Um, sometimes less if someone has started out on a budget in the beginning and then they've you know um, made enough um, profit to reinvest in the business and then they feel like they can afford a proper brand um, some good photos and stuff like that and then they take that opportunity to change the website so it really depends on what stage of the um, um, business cycle you are and also how you started if you bootstrapped in the beginning but now have the funds to invest in it um, but I would say on average about two to three years a refresh um, just because you might have loyal customers coming back and it would be nice to um, have a, a fresh look without doing a total rebrand. You can keep your branding the same, but it's just a, a bit of a facelift um, for mm. your website. And I think it's often, you know, more about is the site really functioning? And if it's not functioning well, then it could be partly the layout that could be um, contributing to the, the lower conversions. So I'd say, you know, there's no one hard or fast rule for that, but it's really looking at your situation and how your site is looking. You know, sometimes um, certain layouts get quite dated um, and there might be some newer um, trends that are coming in that are more user-friendly, something that we've, you know, in, innovated on and, and bought in. And you might think, well, this is a great time for me to, you know, give my site a little um, refresh and and implement some of these better layout features that can help improve like the customer journey, like you're saying, help people to find their way faster and easier. So I think there's a bit of, you know, is your site feeling old and clunky and is it not functioning? Then potentially your, your layout and your, your refresh would help with that. Um, a yeah, lot. I so, do have a blog that, um, it, it, it says, what, when is it time to redesign your website? So okay, um, go and does, have a look at that. <laughs> yeah, and part of it says about the functionality. If you feel like it's not, um, you're not able to add the functionality that you want, um, it's probably a time to upgrade maybe the theme or um, your website platform as well. So um, a lot of people on Shopify start out with a free theme and they find it very limiting. And then after a couple of years, um, they, they need to change the theme to a paid theme. So things like that. Um, Great. my next point. So that was just point number four, customer user journey. I've got my list in case I go off track. <laughs> yeah, I've been floating them down so I remember them too. <laughs> um, the five. next one, you've kind of touched on it before, is calls to action. Um, mm -hmm. I have uh, uh, people who are really good at writing blogs, which is great. Um, and then what happens is you get to the bottom of the blog and it just ends, it just finishes. Um, whereas, you know, a good um, practice <laughs> would be to um, say, here's how we can help you. So, you know, you might have to be fa facing that same situation, but this is how we can help you. Um, book a time to chat with us or um, here's that suitable product or service that will actually solve this whole problem. Give them that next step, what yes. next action they should be doing. So this should be applied to uh, across the website. So you get to um, the bottom of your about page. So they've read it and they go, yeah, actually, I think this person is right for me. And then if you just end it there, so this is all about me and then that's it. Then we're kind of very simple people. Then we kind of need to be told what, you know, what, what step I need to do next. Yes. Just make it really yeah. easy for them to book in with you or submit a form um, mm -hmm. or send you an email. Um, and then yeah. it also comes down to how consistent you are with the calls to action. Like you mentioned before, um, don't just change the buttons or the style of it so that as they're browsing across the site, they know that that next step is that button um, or, you know, that, that um, call to action box color or the photo that comes with it is mm. the, the action they're going to take next. Absolutely. And I love this topic. This is something very close to my heart. You know, I think the about page is actually a sales page in your website that most people don't even realize is a sales page. Um, you know, you absolutely leverage that content because it's, although it is about you and your business in a way, it's actually about your customer kind of going, is this the right person for me? And a really natural thing to have on that at the end is the next step that they should take. Like what should they do now? Um, you know, where do they go next? So decide what's relevant for you and your business, but give them the next step so that they're not just left hanging at the bottom of the page. Um, likewise with blogs, you know, as much as, um, 
having a call to action is there. I even like to take a step further with the blog and think about what is the purpose of the blog before I even start writing it. Do I have something that I would like people to do next, whether it's downloading a freebie or or you know whatever that next thing is that I'd like that, then the blog is setting them up to actually want to take that step. So it's not even just providing something that's there, but the whole blog is giving them the reason why and creating demand for it so that you do get a much higher converting um, call to action if it's a, on a freebie, you're getting subscribers because they really, really want it after reading the blog. So, you know, I think it's just about when you're doing these things, having that thought, you know, what is, what is the next step that I want people to think at, do once they have had this and building that in. So kind of reverse engineering it into whatever it is that you're writing about. Um, it has a lot more impact and, you know, you definitely will help to improve conversions when you do it that way. Yeah. And like you said, you know, if there's a lead magnet, so something that people can sign up to get a freebie, um, you could write a blog that addresses some of the pain points that someone who might need, you know, use that ebook or, or PDF mm. or checklist. Um, summarize that in your blog and then say at the end of it, you know, down to help you um, with those solutions as a solution to all those problems that I've identified in this blog. So um, you can, it's a, definitely a great course to action. Um, again, the next step, is it to download that PDF? Is it to book in a time with you? Is it to um, buy that product that you've mentioned? Um, tell us what we need to be doing at the end of the page. <laughs> um, and yeah. you also split it up between sections, of course. So if it's like, um, uh, for example, on the home page, you have different sections, like, you know, a little bit about the business and have a button to um, read more about uh, on the about page. Um, uh, all yeah. of these are also you know, internal links uh, are favored by Google because you're interlinking your different pages within your website. Um, point number six is about social proof. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of us um, struggle to um, talk about ourselves in a positive light <laughs> and that's totally normal. Um, but sometimes we need to display um, any... Uh, trust so badges and and to build the trust and uh, any affiliations that we might have that will build our credibility so that someone goes oh, okay that's pretty um, high up there in, t in that field um, and she's accredited with that so you know that's probably and that's not an easy accreditation to get so um, it all yeah. adds to your credibility um, so things like for a service-based business you know if you've done any courses um, any uh, certificates um, any uh, affiliations to academies that you might be a part of or, you know, for example, virtual assistants might have like the Australian Virtual Assistant Academy um, or association, then all of that, you know, they should have the badges that you can or logos that you can put um, to display on your homepage and about page at least. Um, so when mm -hmm. someone's reading all about you on your about page and they can see all these badges and they go, oh, yeah, you know, that's, not someone that's just come off the street and started a business. They've actually done a bit of work um, mm -hmm. to, to, to boost their portfolio as well. Um, mm -hmm. Things like, um, yeah, so have that displayed and if you can, as consistent as possible. So, you know, a lot of them come in different colors and shapes and styles. So um, if you can kind of make them grayscale and, and um, the same size, um, and display them nicely on your website so it doesn't overtake. So it's kind of discreetly there. And if people who want that that um, affirmation and, you know, put some weight onto those um, accreditations, then they're there for them to, to see. So um, the other way of doing that as well is just to make sure that you are connected in all of your Google websites. So like Google My Business, because um, then that will allow you to collect mm. reviews on Google. So make sure that, so Google My Business is free for any business. Um, uh, sign that up so that when someone's searching and comparing you, they can read your Google reviews. And also make sure your Facebook reviews are turned on. And I think a lot of people are afraid of getting one possible negative review. Um, don't be afraid of that pos possible that might no never ever come. Um, you know, people are smart enough to read more than one review and make up their mind. Sometimes they, they are aware there are crazy people that just love leaving <laughs> complaining about, you know, there's, there's always one person you can't yeah. please. So don't put that off, um, put you off turning on your reviews. 
Um, yeah, definitely. It does add yeah. a lot of, um, it, uh, you know, helps people make a decision whether they want to hire you or not. Um, yes. And I think that, you know, bringing that through onto your website as well, even though you might feel like, well, I've got those reviews on my Facebook page or on my Google, um, you know, don't make people work hard to find the information that's going to help them to make a decision and to convert faster. If you can bring those through and put them on your website, you know, that really adds um, a lot more social proof and it's in someone else's words. It's not you saying it. So that's a great thing to have. Um, you know, even if you've like links for PR that you've been involved in, articles, podcast episodes, um, you can link all those up on your website. So you can have, um, you know, as seen in or you know, whatever it is um, there with the logos and and actually link them through. Like on my website, I've got a section there where, you know, the media that I've appeared in and where there's an article or a podcast, you know, that's all linked. So you can actually go and listen to that episode or read the article, um, which again, you know, it really helps if someone's ha trying to have a, a really thorough look at what you've done and what you say, then it's all there and it's easily accessible. Um, but I think as well, you know, if I can add a little tip with the testimonials, um, you know, often when someone writes a review for you, they are writing it in, you know, the, the goodness of their heart and, and they often say really lovely things, but they don't always say the most important thing at the very top of the um, review. So, you know, I, what I really like to do is to pull out, you know, if there's a, a punch statement or something that is really powerful, pull that out and make that the heading of the review as opposed to making their name the heading because unless it's their mum or sister or someone who knows them, the name is kind of a bit irrelevant. Um, you know, have the, the actual punchline as the heading and then have the review and, you know, their name is as at the bottom. So, you know, don't feel like you have to only have it in the exact format that they have provided it to you. It's there, it's printed and, you know, in Facebook or wherever, but you can adjust it and make that testimonial um, a much stronger message on your website just by doing a little bit of um, formatting with it. That's a really good point. And this is why I don't like um, when clients ask me to put automatic feeds for Facebook and Google reviews because you, you don't really have much control over that as yeah. opposed to letting that come into Facebook and Google, but then you can copy and paste and even edit if there's ty typos and things like that um, without changing the message. Um, you can definitely, you don't even have to have the whole paragraph because sometimes they can write, you know, um, a lot, which kind of throws off the way your website <laughs> testimonial section yeah. works. Um, so getting the punchy line um, is, mm -hmm. is definitely much more beneficial than having the entire chunk hooked in there. Um, my last and, and if yes. I had to finish off <laughs> my last point is um, on-site SEO yeah. so there are lots of things within the website that you can do to really boost your search engine optimization or SEO um, so I mentioned things like the copywriting so making sure you have enough text that has um, good keywords in there and phrases in there that people are literally searching for um, having your image alt text so every image that you put on your website is um, searchable on uh, Google exactly. however Google cannot look at the image and go oh, okay I understand totally what that that's a cat you know sitting behind a laptop or whatever yeah. um, but what it what it can read is the image alt text that goes in the back end of the website so there's two purposes for image alt text um, the main one is actually for visual impaired um, users uh, so they actually have a screen reader that describes the images to them and then the other um, purpose is all yeah. obviously for search engines to reach to read what it's um, displaying so i yeah. would use that quite and often. it also brings you up in search results as well yeah. like so with your images it, it means that you've got another potential position that you can appear in the search results page because google will show images that are relevant to the search as well and it's really interesting when you've had your site for a while and you look at your analytics to see how many people are actually coming through from an image search or through images, um, image results as opposed to even just the normal um, text search results. And I used to get quite a lot of um, traffic actually from the images because they were really well optimized. So it's definitely something not to miss out on um, because mm. it gives you another spot on that search results page, um, which means you've got more of that real estate that's coming to your website. Yeah, and it is a very easy thing to miss. So, but there are apps and plugins mm. that you can put onto your website that automatically syncs um, the image name and maybe a business name at the end um, every night. So it can be a set and forget thing as long as you name your images well. 
So not just like yeah. taking off pixels <laughs> or slash <laughs> unsplash. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, or some so, random number um, with a letter. Yeah, there. that's but right. Actually renaming the images, yeah. I think, it, you know, there's there's so many layers that you can go into, isn't there, with, with all of this. And that's actually a really good one to get in the practice of doing for your website, but also, you know, content that you're loading up to YouTube. Um, again, YouTube is a search engine. Um, same with Pinterest. You know, really make sure that you're labelling the files that you're loading up because that is all part of the searchable content that's going into these um huge machines I guess is what they really are in the background yep um and then so one more thing with the on-site SEO is to um you, there are plugins that you can do so if you're on WordPress you can install something called Yoast or Rank Math um that will help you to just elevate your content so it'll guide you like a traffic light system mm. um you know whether you need to fluff up your content a little bit more use your keyword a bit more um and, you know, so um, it'll, it'll help you to improve your content for SEO. And also um, to make sure that it's on Shopify, you can do your on-site, your on-page data. So, so the metadata, which is every page, every product, every collection, and every blog will have at the bottom of the page. Um, so using that to make sure it's not just copying the first paragraph of your product descriptions, but making sure that it is um, something that people are searching for because that's what comes up in search engines. Um, so SEO is probably a whole mm. other day's worth of a chat, but um, <laughs> so these Definitely. are just simple things that you haven't, if you haven't already been considering, then these are simple things that you can start considering and fixing up on your website. Yeah, absolutely. And they're really great. I think each of those, I guess you could really expand on even more, but, you know, you can start to see even from this short chat that we've had in these seven, um, seven sort of things that you can do to really increase conversions that there is so much more to a website than what meets the eye. And um, I guess that's why someone might come to somebody like you, Des, and just be like, okay, I know my site isn't working very well for me, but what should we do? Like, is it, is it ready for a whole complete refresh or is there something that we could do just to um, optimize it and maybe, you know, change a little bit of the design and, and apply some new um, layout features and things like that that could actually take a huge lift. You know, you can be surprised how much you could change the look and feel of the website even without doing a complete rebuild. Um, so what, do you, what would you say, like, what are the key things that someone should be thinking about or um, looking at their side and, and thinking, okay, I think I need to go to that next step and, and then really um, get some help to uplift it. That's a great question. And I see some names there that I am currently in discussion with about elevating their website, <laughs> leveling up, um, okay. you know, and there are a few discussions at the moment on Facebook about, you know, how much is a website and some people that's going mind blown. I don't know. I, I don't know why it's so expensive. You know, and you have people saying, I built my mine myself and I built it in a day. It's so easy. Yes, you know, you can have a website that's built in a day, but that website is probably just sitting there and you're having to pay thousands of dollars for ads to try and get people to find your website or come to your website. Um, so having a website that that's actually built for conversions and being found in search engines is a whole other ball game. And, you know, that's all of the things that I discussed here. Or well, some mm. of the things that we discussed here today. So one of the things I would say is if you look at your website and there's not enough words on there, you feel like the keywords are not there, um, you don't know how to fit that in without looking like an Alibaba ad, uh, then that's definitely something to consider. <laughs> For me, um, the copy drives the yeah. design. I don't design a website and then try and fit the words in. Um, we write the words first and then we go, okay, how can we best display the words um, and section them yes. so they're not just all lumped together. So if you mm -hmm. are, if there is one thing that you do, I would say is review your copywriting and invest in that um, because that will change your design quite quite a bit um, in order to meet that yeah. minimum 300 words on each page as well. Yeah. Um, and then if you feel like your brand is a bit tired, um, you're probably investing, thinking about investing in new photography, professional photography, um, some people do a brand refresh as well, then that's a good time to then follow through with your website redesign as mm. well because mm. your website will tie all of that in together and really be the one spot for where your brand can shine and you for you to shine. Um, I, I would say those are the two main things. If your brand needs a, a lift and your copy needs a lift, 
Um, yeah. But also, um, yeah. if you feel like that, that you might be getting traffic and people are not taking the next step, the conversion is not there, then that's probably a time to redesign your mm. website because something's just not working. Um, that's converting them. Mm. And I think, you know, an easy way to, to find out if that's what's happening is in your Google Analytics, you know, go in and have a look at your bounce rate. Um, you know, mm -hmm. have a look at your overall site bounce rate, but you can even drill down to per page and see what's happening. Are people arriving on your site and leaving again straight away? Because if they are, then you know that there's definitely something critical wrong. Um, you know, and if you've got traffic that's coming, like, yeah, I've got traffic and then there's nothing happening. You're not getting signups, you're not getting purchases or sales. Then again, you know that, okay, I've got the people there, but I'm not converting them. So, you know, mm -hmm. that could be a great time to come to an expert and say, right, what are we going to do with my website? How can I convert these people better? And it's probably going to be more than just one thing. There'll be lots of factors at play, which is, you know, a lot of these seven, you know, the top things that you can do to optimize your website that we've spoken about today. So, yeah, that's really yeah. great. And um, so Desiree works with lots of WordPress sites and Shopify sites. Is that right? And so both service and product-based businesses. Um, and you do custom builds and do you also do take an existing site and, and give it a refresh as well? Yes, I call that the zhushing. <laughs> I think um, our biggest um, selling service would be zhushing up websites. So people who have already been in, in business for a couple of years and feel like they need to level up. So um, definitely just WordPress and Shopify. We just feel like that's the two best platforms to be, um, to be on board on. And um, we do... Uh, have a starter package if you're brand new to business and you and you just need to get a presence on um, but then we also have mm. our custom pro um, um, websites where we really take you through the whole process and a strategy and guidance and lots of um, consultations in order to get a website that is you know really different to any other websites that you might have and just customize to your business itself in terms of functionality um, I also mm. do a lot of training and, and workshops and um, uh, one-to-one -one sessions. Um, so whether it's a WordPress website or Shopify uh, or even organic marketing, I do love teaching small businesses to try and DIY or just understand a bit more so they know if they were to invest or outsource with, with someone else, what they should be looking for, asking for and not getting um, taken for a ride. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> yeah. so I think just having that understanding yeah. helps you to um, save mm. a lot of dollars in the end. Definitely. Absolutely. All right. And if they want to get in touch with you, what's the best place to do that? I think a lot of people know me from Facebook. I am in a lot of Facebook groups. Um, so I also have a Facebook group called Organic Digital Marketing, where I have um, similar guest speakers come on, like yourself, Jess, you've been on there. Um, yeah. So we share our knowledge with um, Aussie small business owners to um, try and DIY or improve their own marketing on their websites. Um, and just a place for the small businesses to hang out because a lot of us usually experience similar situations but don't really discuss our problems. But um, we're all going through the same things. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I would say yeah. Facebook is where you can find me, um, especially in the Facebook group, mm -hmm. Organic. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for that great um, content that you've provided. I think there's been a lot of takeaways from that and hopefully – Everybody who joined us on the live has um, at least gone away with something that they can go and implement straight away. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me again. I'll yes, see you no problem. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone.